Welcome to this week's Religion Media Centre briefing, which is a discussion on the fourth international ministerial conference on the freedom of religion or belief. It's going to be held in London on the 5th and 6th of July. So we have a very high powered panel of speakers to talk to us about that today. And rather than read out all the names to start with, I'm going to come to you each in turn, just ask you a few questions of introduction, and then encourage you to discuss this with one another. So if you have a question, those of you who joined the call, do put it in the chat box so that we can ask questions of the panel later. So Fiona Bruce, perhaps I can come to you first. You are the Prime Minister's Special Envoy for the Freedom of Religion or Belief. So thank you for sharing your time today with us. Can I just ask you some basic questions really about this? It's said that this will be the largest government hosted conference in London this year. Can you just give us some idea of the scale of the conference, how many people will attend and what will happen? Yes, well, hello everyone and uh, thank you for, for having me on the call. Um, we're expecting uh, hundreds of delegates uh, from over 60 countries, uh, around half of them will be sending government ministers. Um, so there'll be an official ministerial uh, UK government hosted uh, conference in the QE2 Centre, uh, where we're expecting uh, at, at present around 600 delegates. We're a little, little over capacity now. Um, we were planning on 500, but uh, the event's been extremely popular. Uh, and then in addition to that, there's also going to be uh, a civil society element uh, of the, uh, the conference, which will run uh, within the QE2 also on the first and second floors, and there'll be another two or 300 delegates there. And, and we'll have about 70 plus speakers from around the world, um, survivors of, of four, uh, freedom of religion or belief abuses, uh, but also we'll have faith and belief leaders, we'll have academics, we'll have speakers from a range of, of beliefs and countries talking about the challenges uh, that freedom of religion or belief has under three headings, prevention, protection, and promotion across the world. Um, can I just ask you, this is the fourth international conference. Um, why is it coming to London this time? It's been in Washington, it's been in Poland, I believe. Did you volunteer to host it? Well, the, the reason uh, primarily is that uh, this year, the UK, uh, and I as an individual, uh, I have the privilege of chairing the International Religious Freedom or Belief Alliance, an international alliance currently of, of 36 countries. It was founded just a few years ago. And so uh, the, the Americans, the US, were the initial chair of the alliance in 2018 and 2019. They therefore hosted the, uh, the first ministerial conference conferences in America and now as the UK is the chair of the ERBFA, the alliance this year, um, it's our privilege to, to be hosting this conference. The two don't have to coincide but they are doing this year and so it's, uh, it's a very uh, it, it's special way in which the UK can, can show global leadership uh, by hosting this conference this year when we're chairing the alliance. How high a priority does the UK government give to freedom of religion or belief? It's a very high priority in our human rights work. We have a, a human rights minister, Lord Ahmed, who gives this a priority. Uh, and then the foreign secretary herself, who's spoken about uh, the a network of liberty uh, across the world. Freedom of religion or belief is one of those liberties that uh, is vital if we're going to have a secure and peaceful world uh, today and so it's a very high priority and the, the, the conference itself uh, has the full support of the Prime Minister. Uh, he, he of course is the individual who, who appoints me as a special envoy and that really is a very strong signal internationally of the importance of this issue uh, uh, globally and then uh, the Foreign Secretary will be making the keynote speech on the first morning of the conference before we then move into uh, the, the many sessions uh, throughout the two days of the official ministerial. Thank you. Can I go next to Knox Thomas? Um, I beg your pardon, Knox Thames. You're the former State Department official who designed the first two ministerial meetings in Washington in 2018 and, and 19. So Knox, can I just ask you about how this huge global movement on the freedom of religion or belief 
started because it's quite a recent phenomenon. The first ministerial international conference was in 2018. In the UK, our first minister with this brief was appointed in 2018. What uh, was the, the reason for it, it being suddenly realised as something that the international community wants to coalesce around? Yeah, it's a great question. Thanks for having me and good morning from Washington. Um, it's in response to the pandemic of persecution we see sweeping the globe. We've all been struggling with the COVID pandemic, but studies have shown uh, increasing limitations on the free practice of faith, the ability of individuals to pursue truth as their conscience leads. Um, almost three out of every four people in the world live in an restrictive environment, either due to government or civil society. So you've got the headlines like China, Pakistan, India, Afghanistan, and, and what Russia is doing both at home and in Ukraine. These are some of the, the causes that we were responding to when we launched this effort in 2018 to really rally the world to bring together uh, different countries and different uh, communities across religious, geographic, and political lines committed to a common effort to defend freedom of conscience, freedom of religion or belief uh, for everyone everywhere. But what impact do these ministerial conferences make? We, we had, um, we've got something on our website, just a quick plug for that, uh, some articles explaining what the conference is about and also the latest um, uh, data that there is on the, free, on the persecution um, in the name of religion around the, the, the world. But um, one of the quotes that we have was from Professor Ahmed Shahid, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Freedom of Religion and Belief, who can't be with us today. But what he said was that this is a chance for uh, the international community to build broad coalitions. And I just want to ask you whether that is your experience. Has that happened from other ministerial conferences before? It's been happening, and I think this is a, uh, a positive development in our field. I've been working on these issues for 20 years, and to see uh, the strengthening of government coalitions among like-minded countries is very positive. I mean, we know China and Russia and other oppressive governments, they network, they share their worst practices. So it's important that uh, countries that we live in, that we also rise to meet the challenge, that we find ways to coordinate, to communicate, to ensure that there are consequences when abuses occur, and we find ways to assist the victims of persecution to get them out of harm's way, to help protect them. Uh, because if we don't, we know that this will lead to instability, the rise of violent extremism, and gross human rights abuses that will impact millions of people. But can you point to any policy changes or lives that have been saved? Oh, sure. Um, I mean, We've, uh, with the case with Asia Bibi, uh, I was personally involved with um, trying to pressure the Pakistani government to let her go. But really, the deciding moment was when we were able to use this network of nations to speak in one voice in unison with the Pakistanis. And uh, soon thereafter, she was able to join her family in Canada. So that's one example of one person, but she was the highest profile uh, prisoner of conscience in the world at that time. Um, we're also seeing uh, China react to these statements. They, they don't like the sting of uh, the global attention. Um, we see uh, nations um, uh, pulling back a bit because they know they're being watched. And if we can then, and this is incumbent upon you, how we can use the London Ministerial to strengthen this, to take the next step, to really ensure that, uh, that uh, persecutors know that there will be a, a, a consequence for their abusive practices. Thank you. Uh, moving on to Professor Jocelyn Cesari, you're um, joining us from the States. Sorry, it's so early for you over there. But you're Chair of Religion and Politics at the University of Birmingham, and also now you're Senior Fellow at the Barclay Centre for Religion, Peace and World Affairs at Georgetown University. Um, Professor, could I ask you something about the origins of this um, um, movement uh, around the world? Is it correct to say that the origins lay in the concerns about Christian persecution? And, and in that, do you see any dangers or uh, advantages for that to have been the, the kind of birthplace of the movement? Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ruth, and thank you for this very important discussion. First, I would like to say that the origin lies in the 
US administration of Bill Clinton. <laughs> he was the first one to create a religious freedom ambassador and to try to raise the level of awareness of the persecution of religious uh, groups across the world. And since this uh, origin, which is 1998, if I am not mistaken, uh, there have been a lot of discussion of what this means. And it's true that um, for a while and until now, there was this uh, understanding that the one that were benefiting from this uh, new uh, international policy were uh, Christian groups. And it's no doubt that in the US, uh, some Christian groups have uh, used to their benefit uh, this kind of new uh, administrative tool or political tool. Um, but there have been also a pushback within the US about that. And I would say that since then, the Euro European countries have, have also created different units to monitor uh, religious freedom across the world. And um, in this uh, particular case, um, there may be mobilization on the ground of some uh, specific religious groups, but the, the tension has broadened up since this uh, initial moment. So I, I would say that the, um, there are religious groups that are probably more active than others to use the tool, but the movement has become global. And I also would like to say that um, we, we have to be very careful of what is at stake, what are we monitoring, what are we looking at. Um, there are two types of uh, religious discrimination. One is uh, initiated, so to speak, by governments, and the other comes from interaction of groups in society. And what we are uh, witnessing now across the world is a rise in what we call governmental discrimination against all religious groups. And that's the most worrisome uh, indicator. Uh, actually, social uh, discrimination is more quote unquote stable, but the rise of uh, not only repression or control, but sometimes eradication. Think of the Muslims in China. Think of the Pakist of the uh, Indian uh, proactive uh, repression of of Islam and Muslims. There are lots of indicators. Not mentioning Buddhist states that are the most. Uh, uh, discriminatory uh, in the world, very close to the Muslim majority state. So all this has to be addressed. And I'm not sure that this kind of big conference will really pay attention to this level of governmental discrimination. All right. Thank you. Well, uh, that's a good moment to move to Josh Cass. Uh, Josh, you're chairing a panel at the summit on interreligious um, and interconvictional dialogue. And uh, you, you work uh, within the interfaith world on a, a, with a wide range of organisations. Um, can I just ask you to, to pick up what Jocelyn Cesari was saying then? Um, how much attention is being paid in the summit and in this world to inter-religious inter -religious conflicts? And is there an interfaith lobby that matches the extent and power of the Christian lobbies around the world? Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining, for being on this call and, and for having me along. Um, I, yeah, I was really struck by um, uh, Professor Cesare's comments and this distinction between governmental and civil society um, tensions that exist in relation to um, interreligious and interfaith and interconfessional uh, tensions. Um, I, 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 for me, you know what I'm very excited about with with with, with this ministerial is the prop, is the opportunity to to stress test that proposition that interreligious and interfaith dialogue has a role to play in uh, the promotion and protection of freedom of religion or belief. And I think that there is an assumption that there is a case that 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 is the case, and that there is a role. And I and I believe that there is. But I think that for for too long. 
interfaith, interconfessional, interreligious dialogue activities have been marginalized from these kinds of spaces. Um, and so what, what needs to be seen, I would suggest, is the drawing in of um, more faith communities, more um, uh, confessional um, uh, communities into this conversation to enable us to see how effective um, bringing different faiths and beliefs to the, together can be in in creating societies where um, where freedom of religion can flourish. And I think that hosting the ministry here in the UK is a great opportunity to highlight some of the successes that I, I think do exist in the UK, um, particularly in, in the education space. I think there are some things which we can point to here that, um, that are worth talking about and worth considering um, replicating in other parts of the world as, in, in, as we move to, to, to um, you know, protect for, for all. I was going to ask you about that because Catherine Wright, who uh, from Columbus St. Gabriel, she does a lot of work with um, our organisation anyway, but she's quite heavily involved in the in the summit. And I'm just wondering whether when we talk about the solutions and how mm. things will change, are we once more saying that it's teachers who hold the key to changes in society? I mean, I, as a parent of children, of school aged children, you know, we all... I, 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 and I'm sure many of the people on this call, know the, the, the potential that teachers have for transforming societies for, for the better. But I think that, if I'm completely honest, I think we all have a responsibility. And I think that too often we, uh, you know, we, we subcontract that responsibility out. And I think, but, but yes, schools unquestionably have a role to play in, in, promote, in, in creating cultures where FORB can flourish. And I think... And when I say FORB, I think I need to be, to just be clear by what I mean. I'm not suggesting, I'm not sure that it's about human rights education, though others might disagree. I think high quality religious education, which enables young people to come to understand the complexity of faith in the world is part of a, a, solu a package of solution that will enable, um, you know, religious discrimination and the very f worst forms of religious persecution to in the long run be um, you know be, be, be expunged from the world. Thank you. Um, Mervyn Thomas, I wonder if I could come to you next to talk about these fringe events. Um, you're the chair of the UK Freedom of Religion or Belief Forum and that organisation has been involved as I understand it in organising the fringe which is vast. So these fringe events that are taking place are they just designed to get the ear of politicians? Uh, can you just sketch out for us uh, the extent of it and um, the kind of topics that you're being, uh, that will be discussed and the people that you're drawing in to as uh, speakers for those events? Yeah, well, um, thank you. Um, th yes, I mean, you're right. The fringe is vast and, um, and <clears throat> we're very grateful actually that the, the government has made, <coughs> excuse me, has, has put um, civil society right at the right at the centre of this, and and, and all talks um, with the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, we um, we've been assured that you know the fringe is as much part of the ministerial conference as what is going on with the with the ministers, and so so it's really really important, and um, and we have. We have had well over a hundred events, <coughs> excuse me, registered with us, and they are they are diverse. They are from um, from different faith and belief groups. Um, many of them, uh, you know, we talk about uh, you talk about coalitions earlier, but many of those um, uh, groups that are are hosting um, uh, ministerial side events are put on by um, by. Uh, there's, there's a great event that my own organisation, CSW, is putting on with the British Humanists, for example, uh, so that we, we are, uh, you know, we're making sure that these events are diverse and that it's not, you know, you mentioned earlier something about the fact that, um, you know, this has been driven by Christians and, and, and originally that is absolutely right. But it certainly has widened out, and the UK for Forum is is a, very much a case in point that that is made up of organisations and groups uh, of people from from all faith groups and and none. And so these uh, these ministerial side events and there is a if people want to go and look on the um the, on the uh, website that's actually registering these events, which is the LondonForFringe.com. 
um, you'll see that the breadth of of of, um, uh, of events there are. Some of them are taking place. Um, unfortunately, it's only the minority, but some of them are taking place in the um, in the QE2 itself. Some of them are taking. Many of them are taking place in Parliament. Others are taking place in other parts of of um, of London and also around the country. So, uh, and, and these will be particularly those that are in the QE2. We know that people, from the ministers that are going to be at the main event, are going to be encouraged to come down to the civil society events. So we will be hopefully addressing some ministers from around the world. Thank you. And thanks for joining us from your car. I don't know where you're going to or coming back from, but greatly appreciate your time. Um, you. Andrew uh, Copson, Chief Executive of Humanist UK. We've heard there about the alliances that have been forged. I'm just wondering whether you feel it's a constant uphill battle to get uh, non-religion referred to, referenced, uh, spoken of, um, talked about at these events? Yes, I think that's a fair assessment. Um, very often the phrase religious freedom is used when what really the human right is about is freedom of religion or belief, um, and that that's a universal right for every person, as Knox said, to be able to live true to their own conscience and beliefs and values, whatever they might be, whether religious or non-religious. But I think there's been growing inclusion over the last few years. What you've had really, um, I think, coming together to make this new sort of fork world is as you've said, some influence from Christian groups who've been concerned about Christian persecution have had NGOs to look at uh, Christian suffering around the world. But you've got a second strand, which is just as old really, and it's been going for 30 or 40 years, of human rights work around freedom of religion and belief, freedom of conscience, um, the sort of work that NGOs like Humanist International have been involved in for many decades. And I think those two um, forces are sort of combining now um, a lot more, and I think that's very welcome, but we must always remain uh, aware that this is a human right for everyone, that freedom of religion and belief is as much for uh, the dissenter, the reformer, and the non-religious person with positive non-religious beliefs um, of their own, as well as rejectors of religious beliefs. Um, they all enjoy the benefit of this right. And is it fair to say that one of your main ambitions or goals in your lobbying at this event will be around blasphemy laws and the end to blasphemy laws? Absolutely. There are humanist participants, of course, in the in the main ministerial sessions, but also in many fringe events. And in lots of the fringe events, the spectre of blasphemy laws around the world will be looming very large. It is um, a rising tide of persecution that we're experiencing where uh, people from either minority religions or non-religious people are being made victims of blasphemy laws. Um, as the professor pointed out a few moments ago, that might be from two directions. It might be actual states and governments actively prosecuting and persecuting people uh, for blasphemy, but it can also be blasphemy laws and blasphemy norms being used by, not by the state, but by other people within society to victimise um, sometimes to kill people who they think have been blaspheming and the state then allowing those non-state actors a certain level of impunity in doing so. So we've seen humanists and Christians in Pakistan targeted in this way. We've seen uh, in India a different sort of um, mode, um, not a strict blasphemy law, but a sort of blasphemy norm that's being enforced about against people who aren't uh, Hindus. And it's, it's growing all over the world. So blasphemy laws, raising awareness of them, um, is definitely, I think, one of the, the key themes in, in freedom of religion or belief today. And your allies, do they include people of faith, people from religion? Oh, absolutely, of course. I mean, as Murph said, you know, it's, it's, it's a very... Uh, it's very visible, it's increasingly visible that humanists, Christians, Hindus, Sikhs, people of all sorts of uh, religions, Muslims, Jews, etc., etc., I won't list everyone, um, that there's a real multipolar alliance developing um, around this because everyone is persecuted somewhere. I mean, just as much as this state or that state might have a Christian or a Muslim or in the case of somewhere like China, an atheist um, mission, um, and people are persecuted in those countries. The people that are in charge in country A are the people who are persecuted in country B. So we've all got an interest, um, especially if we're people of goodwill who care in principle about freedom of belief. Um, but even if we weren't pragmatically, we've all got an interest in standing beside each other for this because everyone's a minority somewhere and everyone suffers somewhere in the world. Well, um, perhaps we can uh, turn this into a group discussion amongst yourselves. Can we pick up that point about data? What do we mean when we talk about uh, persecution um, and how is the data collected and, and uh, how should you trust it? I mean, Trump said in um, 2018, 80% of the world's 
population is persecuted for religion in some shape or form or, ex or experiences religious discrimination. And that was debunked by um, a fact-checking uh, journalist organisation in the state. So uh, what I'm trying to get at is who collects the data? How do you trust the data? And what is the data looking for? I don't know who wants to come back on that. Um, Jocelyn or Knox? I mean, there have been organizations monitoring this um, uh, kind of uh, situation for decades. Now, I'm thinking of the Pew Forum, um, which is based in Washington, D.C., um, and that has uh, very recurrent data on the rise of discrimination against religious groups across the world. So... Uh, and this is done, again, the, the interest here is to have a continuous data to see the evolution. And what they show is that um, discrimination against religious groups, minority or not, I think it's important to insist on that, not only the minorities are discriminated in some cases. Um, this has been growing for uh, three decades at least. Um, and one of the turning point is the end of the 90s and early 2000. And in some area, it's directly related to 9-11. Um, and the fact that states at this moment, everywhere have uh, tightened up laws and regulation, crushing on uh, freedom of speech, actually, including freedom of religion in the name of security and safety of citizens. And I would like to say that the, the, the pandemic has increased this, uh, this trend uh, everywhere. Uh, so there are, there are data you can look into that, that show that pretty, pretty strikingly. Um, Knox, can I just ask you, what would be the benefits of manipulating the data to make it seem worse than it is? That would be... Uh... <clears throat> That'd be a, a dangerous mistake. As, as a former policymaker, you learn really quickly which groups are being accurate and taking the time to give you uh, information that you can rely upon and which groups are playing with numbers to try to play up the severity of the problem. I think when we talk about religious persecution, we have to be very careful about how we use that term and really uh, set it aside for the most egregious situations, uh, situations where there's violence, where there's no recourse for um, abuses where people are really hopeless. Um, and, and our context here at the height of the COVID uh, crisis, when local officials were, you know, closing churches and places of worship because of health reasons, some people start talking about, oh, there's religious persecution in America. And I actually wrote an article saying, no, 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 that's, that could be problem. It might be problematic. It might be discriminatory, but persecution is a different category. It's the genocide that China or Burma is committing against Uyghurs, it's ISIS going after Yazidis and Christians, it's, uh, you know, Russia bombing churches. I mean, these are, it's, it's next level. So we have to be very careful about the language. And um, at the same time, that's not to play down the discrimination that some groups feel. And there are responses that we should muster, but um, there's a spectrum of abuses. And the more careful groups are with uh, laying out their problems along that spectrum, the better and savvier the government response can be and the more trust they'll build with their interlocutors. Can I go back to Fiona Bruce now, the Prime Minister's Special Envoy for the Freedom of Religion or Belief. You stayed with us through listening to everything. But can I ask you to respond to some of those questions about interfaith dialogue, interreligious dialogue, and how important it is for the government to foster that, to encourage that? It's really important because if we're going to prevent violations of fraud occurring, we need to work with different religious communities. We need to work with the local civil society groups to discover flashpoints. We need to seek and identify and disarm sources of tension um, so that we can actually prevent those flashpoints becoming uh, violent and then ultimately leading to a, a real disruption of uh, of, of peace, not just in local communities, but, but wider across countries. So actually this interfaith dialogue, this talking uh, is so important. And it's one of the things that um, is a priority at the conference that if governments can work better 
with civil society and faith and non-faith groups, then we could see some of these grievous violations uh, of form prevented in so many different places. So it's a real priority. Um, I can I pick, pick up a question in the chat box from uh, Dabinderjit Singh. Uh, he says schools in the UK have a massive bullying and discrimination problem. We get repeated examples of Sikh children being picked upon because of their faith and identity. Is it, um, I mean, this is an international conference, uh, Fiona, going back to you, Fiona, on, on this one. Mm -hmm. um, but um, uh, religious discrimination in this country is also uh, obviously a major concern. And I'm wondering how, how big a proportion of your work is involved in things that take place within the UK, as well as the international scene. Well, actually, my mandate is, is international. Um, it, it isn't UK based. Uh, we have a Minister for Faith, Kemi Badenoch. Um, but nonetheless, you're, you're absolutely right that there are concerns. We've seen this, for example, within the Jewish community in the UK. And so the governments um, work very closely uh, with the, the Jewish organisations, uh, the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust and others, in order to address this. It is so important that um, if a country is seeking to engage internationally, indeed globally, on, on this issue of freedom of religion or belief, that we do address concerns within our, our own countries too. And so um, it's concerning to hear of, of, of situations like that. And I, I, I would encourage anyone who's experiencing that kind of um, issue to, to make sure that they do make contact, uh, for example, with, with our Minister for Faith, Kebi Badenoch. Um, and if I can say that we, we have also, in planning this conference, we've had a, a civil society advisory group uh, working very closely with government. Some of the, the members of that advisory group are, uh, are on the call today. And we've had a wide range of, of uh, faith backgrounds represented on that group. We've had Sikhs, Ahmadiyya Muslims, uh, Jewish Baha'is, the humanists and others. Um, so that we've made sure that we really do have a, a good representation at our conference of, of all the relevant backgrounds, both from within the UK and beyond. Mm, thank you. Um, just to say to everybody, you are permitted to ask questions, so do put them in the chat box or raise your hand and, and put them yourself. Can I move on to the balance of freedoms now? Um, how do you balance the freedom of religion versus, for example, uh, freedom of expression, as we saw in the recent protests of the Lady, uh, Our Lady in Heaven film? Um, or how do you balance it with uh, gender issues, for example, as we see in America with the abortion debate at the moment? This is a difficult question. I don't know who would like to open their mic and start the, start the response to that, but um, how do you balance the uh, freedoms, um, freedom of religion with other freedoms? I think there's a, there's a flaw really in, 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 in the premise of your question because that question um, set freedom of religion or belief, although you said freedom of religion, but freedom of religion or belief um, against uh, freedom of expression or against, um, in the case of the United States example, um, women's reproducting sexual health rights. But in fact, freedom of religion and belief helps to unlock um, both of those situations itself, because um, when you're faced with something like Our Lady of Heaven, you can you can be, you can see by applying a freedom of religion and belief lens that actually the makers of the film are as entitled to their freedom of belief and therefore to you know manifest that through the making of the film and the expression of their values, um, as are the people to protest outside. And so you can apply the freedom of belief framework and say people should be able to protest, but they shouldn't be able to prevent other people expressing their beliefs, e.g. through this film. And the same with um, the rights of women. One of the, one of the ways in which the recent decision in the United States infringes freedom of religion or belief, of course, is that it imposes on all women in America uh, one particular uh, view, violating each woman's freedom of conscience and freedom of belief herself, as some Jewish groups have pointed out in the US. Um, it's a serious violation of many people's um, freedom of belief as Jews who don't believe that um, fetuses are people and so on and so forth. So I think actually that contrary to the um, conflicts that you've uh, set up, freedom of religion or belief actually unlocks those conflicts. It, it isn't a, a, a clash of one thing versus another. It's actually the way to resolve both of those situations and many more in favour of the freedom of the individual to their own conscience and belief and not to have the state interfere with their freedom of, of, of belief in the ways that you've 
that you've described by, for example, taking away their reproductive choices or preventing them from making and seeing a film. Can I bring in Fiona Bruce here again? Yes, thank you. I think the important way to look at this is that freedom of religion or belief is completely intertwined with other human rights, um, with, with, with the right to uh, not just uh, have free speech and expression and assembly, but actually where it's it's denied, where Forbes is denied, you can have people denied healthcare. We saw that during the pandemic, denied an education or a job, or where they can't get access to justice through the court system. They're denied their liberty, uh, where they're tortured or killed, they can be denied their lives. So we have to see freedom of religion or belief in the context of being linked with all these other rights. And that's why it's so important for us to, to focus on this particular right, which hasn't had enough attention globally over a long time, because where that is lost, so many other rights can be lost as well. Thank you. And Jocelyn Cesari? Yes, I would like to, to uh, point out that this question of freedom of religion versus uh, freedom of speech cannot be addressed only abstractly. It's really very much linked to what is the status of religious freedom and expression of religion in each public space. Um, for example, in Europe, there is a lot of uh, limitation on freedom of speech based on some issue of racial hatred, negation of the Holocaust. And despite that, you have a lot of uh, position that, that e exactly do that. So the limit here is what is uh, freedom of speech and walking the line between expressing a position and, and getting into insult. And if it's insult, religious groups have absolutely the right to express their opinion. I would even like to say that in the case of Lady uh, of Heaven, all religious groups can have the right to express that they don't agree. What they cannot do is transform this public opinion into a tool to oppress the freedom of expression of others. And we have seen that again and again um, in the UK since, since the Salman Rushdie uh, book. So uh, it's a very fine line and, and it's very difficult for legislators, politicians and activists sometimes to be able to weigh what is the legitimacy of one claim versus the other. And, and we have to make room in the public space for religious voices to express their disagreement. But we cannot accept that these religious voices will use this space to oppress the, the other opinion or to claim religious demands like excommunication or treating this as blasphemous. This is not acceptable in a public space. Um, but I have to say that a lot of the religious members of this community would not go as far. And sometimes we confuse the claim by religious leaders motivated by political agenda, sometimes outside the, the given space, and the reality of believers who try to deal with all these conflicting uh, positions. Thank you. Dabinder Jitsing. Thank you, Ruth. Ruth, it's a slight variation on your question. It's, it's really meant for Fiona. Given the UK's hosting this conference, and given the importance of trade to the UK, I, I raised the example of India being a very populous country, being led by a, a government that does very much, and it's known throughout the globe in terms of what the US says about religious freedoms and beliefs in India. And I'm really saying, how seriously can we take the UK government if publicly it will not criticize India for example, the FCDO Human Rights Report never talks about religious freedoms in India. It's completely silent. Well, the, the UK government actually condemns any instances of discrimination because of freedom of religion or belief, regardless of the country or, or indeed the faith involved. And um, I know that where uh, there are concerns, uh, ministers, including our minister, Lord Ahmed, will raise them directly with the government, uh, including in India, uh, at ministerial level. So um, it, it, it's, it's correct to say that any reports of, of this kind of nature are taken very, very seriously. 
Um, but one thing I will say is that what we've tried to do um, at this conference is, uh, is to focus on thematic subjects for our sessions rather than point the finger at individual countries. We want to ensure that we do promote dialogue uh, and that's why we've decided to, to, to focus all the sessions on different subjects, whether it's um, on uh, uh, engaging the next generation or cultural heritage or atrocity prevention or form and the media or women and girls um, or interreligious dialogue as we've heard. Um, so that we can hopefully bring into the conversation as many representatives from as many countries as possible without them feeling that they're being uh, individually targeted in a way that will drive them from the conference rather than attract them to it. And I've been very encouraged, actually, uh, as to how more than one government representative from a country which isn't, for example, part of our international alliance of 36 countries committed to championing for more than one ambassador has now approached me and said, can I have an invitation? We're on a journey. We want to know more. And I think that's a very positive way to be approaching this kind of conference. But it doesn't mean that we condone for violations or abuses wherever they happen in the world. Are you permitted to say which country that ambassador was from? Fiona? Can you tell us that? Yes, I don't mind at all. Yes, I, I had a, a, a positive approach from the ambassador from Uzbekistan who would heard about the conference and uh, wanted to engage. Now, there are real issues in Uzbekistan regarding freedom of religion or belief, uh, and he, he acknowledged that. But I thought the very fact that he wanted to dialogue uh, was something which we should welcome, uh, and I did so. All countries that have been um, highlighted in various recent reports, I'm thinking the Open Doors report and the World Watch Monitor that has highlighted Afghanistan, Nigeria, many other countries. Are they going to be um, attending the conference, those countries? There are many representatives coming from Nigeria. And uh, I know personally um, in one of the sessions on education of uh, a young girl who's fled Afghanistan, uh, so we will be hearing firsthand from uh, both survivors and from civil society representatives working in countries like that. Um, so, yes, absolutely. Thank you, Josh. You've had your hand up for a while. Thank you. I just wanted to come back on the, the, the point earlier um, relating to this tension between FORB and other human rights. Um, in my experience of as being a practitioner of, of working with um, civil servants, providing training, um, particularly with colleagues in ministries of foreign affairs, there is, I think it's fair to say, a reluctance and a hesitancy around navigating the line that was being illustrated in your question, Ruth. And I think that's, I think we need to acknowledge the fact that the, the, the co our colleagues who are in the end delivering government policies around the world find this question tricky. And I think we all find it tricky. And, and so I, why, I, why I raise this is because I think it's important that there are the conversations like this and the ministerial next week, because I think it enables colleagues who are in positions where they are making choices about how to allocate resources in relation to the promotion and protection of FORB are given the confidence to engage with these questions in a more, in, in, you know, in, in the relative safety of an international ministerial, they can engage with the complex issues, they can come to understand these tensions a little better so that we can make better decisions about how, um, how policy is implemented. But, it, but I do think there is, a, there is a gap, if I'm honest, in relation to how colleagues are supported to engage with these issues. They're not easy issues they, and they are sensitive. And I think that we need, it, it, my plea for next week would be that we are thinking about how we support colleagues who are making decisions on the ground to make better decisions, to make decisions which they have confidence in based on the fact that they're able to engage with people of different faiths and beliefs, engage with the complexities of religion in different societies, different contexts, so that they can make well-informed policy decisions. Um, I'll leave it there. And Fiona, do you want to come back on that? Yes, that's such an important comment. And um, that's why for, for some time now, the, the UK Foreign Office has been developing toolkits for our um, diplomats 
across the world so that it can have a better understanding of uh, different faith communities uh, so that they can uh, develop what's what's called religious literacy um, and you're absolutely right to have the confidence to to dialogue to have the confidence to to discuss um, issues relating to freedom of religion or belief with with different communities is so important and and one of the benefits of the conferences so that we can share best practice across government representatives. How can we uh, include, for example, freedom of religion or belief in our foreign policy making, in, our, in some of our domestic policy decisions, which is also important? How can we strengthen, as I, I mentioned earlier, for example, our legal systems? How can we better protect uh, women and girls, uh, where they're in, in minority groups and they're they're suffering potentially a double jeopardy because of their their gender and beliefs. So all of these issues are really important, and and I think if we can build confidence amongst decision makers, uh, then that will be one of the real benefits uh, and positive outcomes of the conference. You're absolutely right to raise it. There's a, another question for you here, Fiona, uh, in the chat box. Will the UK government go so, so far as to introduce trade sanctions against Nigeria, India? Well, the, the government is constantly looking at where it can uh, properly apply uh, the sanctions process. And I think it, it's fair to say that increasingly, I won't mention any particular countries, but increasingly we're, we're looking at how those sanctions can apply to individuals who are guilty of four violations, wherever that might be in the world. Would that include China? Presumably it's China that you have in mind. Uh, it, it, it would indeed. It would indeed. I think that's uh, very important. We've already uh, obviously sanctioned a number of, of individuals and, and it's a continued process to, to be looking at this um so absolutely and um, Knox I think this question of sanctions gets to sort of the bigger question of this whole process of ministerial meetings this elevated attention and it's something for those of us from the advocacy side now uh need to continue to press all our governments the United States United Kingdom others who will be attending to not just talk about the problem but to do something about the problem and that raises tough questions about, you know, how much do we value our values? It's, it's easy to say, oh, it's really bad in country X or Y or Z, um, but what, how will our relationships change with that country to reflect the criticism that we just laid? If, if all our nations just talk about it and don't act, it kills our credibility, it undermines deterrence, and it sells out the victims who are going to be left in these horrible situations. So. You know, now that I'm out of government, I, I think we all need to be thinking about how do we insist that our countries who espouse these values, who are like minded, who share a commitment to freedom of religion or belief for everybody. What do we do when countries don't change and what kind of sanctions, what kind of pressure, what kind of encouragement can we apply? Because if we don't do anything, then I think um, uh, talk is this talk is pretty cheap. Well, you've been involved in this area for decades now, haven't you? I mean, the frustration that you're speaking about there is that nothing really has been done. Despite this having been raised, nothing has been done. I would say nothing has been done, but the problem is so immense that we've got to keep insisting that more is, is done. Uh, you know, the London meeting, the Washington meeting, these were not an end to a process. They were just a way station. They were a point to bring together allies from governments and civil society and religious groups and non and, and belief groups around this common problem, this common challenge to figure out, okay, what are we going to do? How are we going to ensure that the day after the conference, the world is going to be a little bit better positioned to respond? Um, and, and it's hard. I mean, as a former policymaker, it is hard to uh, convince your bosses to maybe pull back on the trade deal or add a clause on the uh, military equipment support program or to, you know, potentially offend a visiting head of state. Um, but that's what we need to be insisting upon because we know if we ignore these challenges, if persecution is allowed to continue, uh, stability is going to erode, human rights abuses will continue, refugee flows will increase. Um, so it's, 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 it's smart to get ahead of it, to get upstream of it, but it's going to also take some hard decisions now and I'm hoping, uh, thanks to Fiona's great work and Merv's great work and the whole team, that we're going to have the right people together in London 
to have these important conversations so we can try to take the next step forward. It's all conversations though, isn't it, Knox? And no action. Well, that's where it starts. I mean, bringing people together. I believe in talking. I believe in communication. Um, but then it's, okay, how are we going, what are we going to do? And um, that's, that's for all human rights work. This is not limited to FORB. Um, you know, getting policymakers to consider human rights in a more robust way in their engagements is the continual challenge of all human rights advocates on every issue. This one's no exception. Although I would argue that FORB is unique and that how it's, it's so interconnected into the whole panoply of human rights. If, if countries can get FORB right, then almost by definition, they're gonna be better on freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, freedom of conscience, uh, political participation, a host of other goods flow from it in ways that are uh, unique in the, in the human rights world. Thank you. One more question in the chat box from Kieran Kelly. Fiona mentioned um, including FORB considerations in domestic policies. Are there particular areas where this is a challenge or is at risk? Lack of religious literacy often seems to be a factor in the UK. Yes, one thing I'd like to see is, is actually FORB in our education curricula. That would be a great start. One of the, the aspirations of this conference is to create young FORB ambassadors, young champions amongst the, the, the young generation that can really get hold of the, the extent of this problem globally. Um, we've all seen what they've done with, with climate change and uh, really spread the word and, and actually pressurised governments in that respect. So that's one area of, of global, uh, of, uh, of national policy making where we could really see some uh, uh, progress if we could get uh, FORB onto education curricula. And it's one of the things that the, the International uh, Religious Freedom or Belief Alliance um, through our education working group is looking at, can we produce some materials which we could then share amongst the 36 countries which are currently members of our uh, alliance so that we really could start to um, uh, get the next generation uh, understanding and inspired about the importance of Ford across the world. Thank you. Um, Andrew? I, I was actually going to uh, respond to um, the, the, the pushing that you were doing on, on, on Fiona and Knox about um, is it just talk, is it just um, you know, pious utterances, is the talk cheap and so on. And because I realise you're being very journalistic about it and pushing them for hard answers, but um, I think it was a little bit unfair because, you know, talk really does matter. And in areas like this, um, where there's an opportunity to say the sort of things about FORB and about human rights in general that some of the government ministers may not have heard before, but certainly many of them may have thought before, and to visibly display the inclusive nature um, of, of FORB in, in the way that it will be displayed, how you can have buy-in from religious and non-religious groups, how it can touch and interpenetrate all other areas of public policy, how freedom of religion and belief can lead to more dynamic societies in every sense, you know, freedom of thought is what drives not just social progress and individual fulfillment, but also economic achievement, innovation, dynamism. Um, you know, those things are actually important messages for people to hear. And I think that in addition to the fact that the national governments present will be invited to make specific pledges um, as part of the ministerial, those things really do matter. And I think that there's a great vibrancy, especially in civil society that will be present, and that those things will have an impact. I, That's I what I was going to say, but can I say yeah. something about the UK? Yes. Because I'm on this question about the UK. Um, I think it is really important in light of that, that we do um, own up about some things about the UK and, and, and also make our own pledge to be better. I mean, I'm as proud as anyone of the fact that the UK you know, ranks relatively highly in terms of freedom of thought, conscience and freedom of thought. But, you know, it, we're, we're sort of at the bottom of the first division, maybe floating at the top of the second division. There's lots of things that we can improve. And we should be, I say we here as, as, as the UK, and I'm not obviously not speaking for the UK, I'm speaking for humanists, but um, the UK, I should say then, the UK um, should do more, I think, to implement FORB um, domestically so as to be a better international example. And we the UK, not we, the UK, um, often uh, rejects calls from the UN Special Rapporteurs um, on children's rights or on freedom of religion and belief that are FORB related. Recently, the UN report on the FORB rights of young people in the UK recommended that our you know, laws mandating religious worship in schools and our curriculum laws and our discrimination laws should all be looked at. And the UK really quite often rejects those calls. So I do think that it's fair to have the UK in the in your in your uh, sites as well and i hope that maybe the uk government will be able to make a pledge in the ministerial to be better and to be a better example to the world because it's an opportunity for that as much as 
as much as it is for anything else. So will you take up that, Fiona? Um, I just wanted to say, I am very pleased to say that um, uh, as the conference has approached, Kemi Badenoch, uh, our Minister for Faith, has uh, contacted me and she's engaging with the planning and she will be in the conference, uh, in the official ministerial, and she'll be at one of the sessions. So I'm delighted to, uh, to say that, uh, yes, we're taking it all on board. And, and I, I hear uh, a lot of what people say, and uh, I, I agree. There is work to be done in our country as well as elsewhere. One of the things we have to remember, however, is that um, what is, is happening across the world to millions of people is the most egregious and gross persecution uh, uh, in terms of people losing their, their liberty, their lives, uh, being attacked, uh, having their uh, homes, their jobs uh, taken away from them. Uh, so all of these uh, issues are certainly ones that in, in terms of their, their grossness, we, we mustn't forget about whilst at the same time also looking at where there is discrimination at home. Thank you. And we've come to the end of the hour. So thank you very much indeed to all our panellists, particularly for sparing your time to get involved in this discussion and for everyone on the call, thank you for joining. Uh, this will be recorded and put up on our YouTube channel. There'll be a report on our website as soon as we can do it, basically. So do join us again for another media briefing next week. But meanwhile, thank you very much and goodbye. <laughs>